Good morning. I'm Doug Lyle. I'm a psychologist. My dad says that this means that anything I have to say couldn't possibly be very important. <laughs> Mostly he's probably right. But not this morning. This morning I've been asked to introduce T. Colin Campbell. Did you ever go to a dinner party and the subject of diet and health comes up? What do you do? I have this battle inside. Am I going to let it go? <laughs> or am I going to pull a McDougal? <laughs> now, Dr. John McDougal thinks that McDougaling is when you eat a health promoting vegetarian diet. And this is true, I'll, I'll concede that. But pulling a McDougal is something completely different. This is a sudden, inexplicable, irresistible, pathological <laughs> urge to tell the truth, no matter what the consequences. Now, don't be too proud of it. It's a disease. Of course, when I do this at a dinner party, the open-minded, curious, thoughtful carnivores present are always so appreciative when I share my knowledge. You know how they are. The love flows. Now, I don't know what happens to you, but when the disease strikes in me, fortunately, rarely, I'll go home, I'll look myself in the mirror, and I'll ask, well, you studly, handsome genius, what on earth were you thinking? <laughs> Telling the truth in the face of serious consequences is heroic. Heroic, but not recommended. It's a personality flaw, and there's no percentage in it. But there are those who won't play the percentages, like T. Colin Campbell. Growing up on the family dairy farm, young Colin Campbell thought that milk and cheese was great. He went to school, became a nutritional biochemist, bent upon finding a better way to feed the world high-quality animal protein to help save the world. He was so outstanding that he rose relentlessly through the academic ranks to become, among other things, the senior science advisor to the American Institute for Cancer Research, an endowed professor at Cornell University, the number one research institution in nutritional biochemistry in America. And finally, the principal investigator of the China study, the most sophisticated epidemiological study of diet and disease ever conducted. But there has been a problem. Professor Campbell learned that milk and cheese weren't so good after all. When he and his colleagues discovered this, it became clear that this was a discovery of incalculable importance. It could help save the world, but very, very inconveniently for the powers that be. Telling these truths has led him not to problems at a dinner party, but to cross swords with powerful industries. It has meant facing down congressional level pressure and dealing with university and government agents suggesting what the great professor should study and what conclusions he should reach. But to the frustration of all these fine, psychologically well-adjusted folks, Colin Campbell could not manage to keep himself quiet, no matter what the consequences. He not only discovers the truth, but he will tell it. Today we get the chance to have him tell us something of his work. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce my colleague, mentor, friend, and hero, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. I've enjoyed a few times being in the audience and listened to
to Dr. I mean, Dr. Lyle and give his lectures, really enjoyed it. But this is the first time I've had to follow his remarks. <laughs> Doug, you should come back up here again and keep this up. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist, though, by the way. I do have a lot to say, but before doing that, um, let me first thank Jeff and Sabrina Nelson for the invitation, putting this program together, and I do hope, in fact, that they'll continue this for years to come, because I think <laughs> I think they're really on to something. I know they're on to something. I've got a lot to talk about in a fairly short period of time, and as I was thinking about putting these thoughts together and some slides and things like this, I, I, I really had a hard time selecting what, what to put in it to try to cover this sort of this sea, this ocean of information, in a sense, uh, that to me is so convincing. It is really so convincing. And my convincing or my sort of enthusiasm for this work has really come about because of the evidence in the research world that I've been involved with for now, gosh, 40 to almost 50 years, I guess, 40 some years. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of touch the tops of some waves. Uh, and, and tell you why I think this is so important. It unfolds, though. My comments really unfold, in a sense, with my own sort of research career, if you will. I hope you forgive me for that. Uh, but I did, in fact, with my colleagues, my many, many students, uh, fellow professors in some cases, not all, obviously, um, did, in fact, go through this and sort of asking the obvious questions and then going to the next questions and so forth and so on to finally come to this point where I guess I have to say I'm a vegetarian or a vegan. And that's not where I started out to be, as Doug has pointed out. But the evidence is really so powerful, and I'm sure that many of you appreciate that, and the distinguished group of speakers that you will be hearing here, I think you'll enjoy. They have been pioneers in this field. And so I'm just going to kind of fill in some cracks insofar as the research is concerned. OK, let's start with the problem. You know the problem. I just decided to put down a few thoughts here that, just to tell you, the problem is really big. Adults overweight, 65%, a third of us are obese, the youth are especially vulnerable. During any given week, according to some surveys, half of us take at least one prescription drug in this country, and four out of five of us take some kind of medication. But yet, the drug reactions, the adverse drug reactions and other medication errors make it the number three cause of death in this country. 225,000 people a year. How many times have you seen that? Heart disease, number one, cancer, number two, and going to the doctor, number three? <laughs> That's a pretty tough message. Yet at the same time, the cost of medical care in this country is the highest that is in the world. Germany's second, it's only 60% of us. So we're paying a lot in many ways. And so in the final analysis, we now know that most of these disease-related deaths, really, quite frankly, are preventable by diet. So if, it, if we can cr solve this problem or help to solve this problem through dietary approaches, there's two ways, the way I think about it, as I look back, there's two ways. One I call the pharmaceutical approach, where we use single nutrients, you know, like nutrient supplements and things like that, or their analogs where the long-term benefits are highly questionable. And incidentally, just this, what was it, maybe two months ago, there's a really substantial report now coming out summarizing these multiple mega-million dollar studies that have been done on nutrient supplements, concluding, in fact, that vitamins A and C and E don't work. Really, they don't work, not the long-term benefit. But in any case, that's the pharmaceutical approach, taking a single chemical coming out and claiming that's nutrition. Nutritional approach is really involves the highly integrated effects of all the so-called nutrients or chemicals in food, as food. It's a natural sort of way. Now, let's look at a little bit of the background, because as I said, I go back some four or five decades. And I can tell you that as, as I look back, this particular chart here was key. It was a chart that was put together by Ken Carroll, the late Ken, Ken K. K. Carroll at the University of Western Ontario where he basically compared the breast cancer rates for different countries. Some others did this too, but Ken's work was particularly uh, notable in this, in this case. And what he showed is that 
there are big differences between breast cancer rates in different countries, number one. And number two, it seems to show this really impressive relationship with dietary fat. And it was from that, this particular body of data that really gave rise to some policy and some education and some other statements about 20, 30 years ago that we should cut down on our fat intake. That plus the information on, on fat and heart disease as well. But in any case, this kind of plot here, one could put breast cancer on that y-axis, colon cancer, heart disease, and so forth and so on, and see that kind of relationship with dietary fat. That's why we got caught up in this idea of thinking about dietary fat. Okay, the second point to make about that previous slide is that there now have been dozens of studies, so-called migrant studies, when we know that when people move from one risk area, from a high risk area to a low risk area, vice versa, they get the disease of the country to which they move without changing their genes. Interesting. So it's an environmental, and would argue largely a dietary sort of phenomenon. But I, I sort of wonder a little bit why it is that these days we're emphasizing genetics so much as a cause of disease. I mean, every single, I'll just say this, every single biological event that we experience starts out with a gene. But that does not mean the genes are sitting there and sort of doing their own thing. These genes have to get expressed, and that's where nutrition comes into play. And so, quite frankly, we've known in the field for a long time that not more than 2 to 3 percent of cancers, for example, can, that is really attributable to genes, it's nutrition, okay, largely from these migrant studies. My own um, work, uh, formally at least, uh, after I got out of graduate school, was getting involved in a big nationwide program of feeding malnourished and starving children in the Philippines with my senior mentor at the time, uh, Butch Engel. It goes back to the 60s. Got things backwards here again, anyhow, sorry. <laughs> when we went to the Philippines, and because of my previous training, you know, trying to grow cows better and regarding the animal protein so highly, um, we were led to believe that if you're going to actually feed kids in the third world, one of the most important things is to make sure they got enough protein. And what they generally meant by that was making sure they got enough animal-based protein, okay? So that's what I did when I got, first got involved in the, in, in the uh, Philippine study. But then I noted through sort of happenstance and as it were, uh, an observation, namely that higher protein intakes, quite frankly, were associated with higher rates of liver cancer in children. We had another project going trying to figure out what really caused liver cancer, by the way. And we thought it was related to a so-called microtoxin or mold toxin called aflatoxin, and that was the theory of the day. And in any case, what really turned out to be the case, and this was exactly the opposite of what, in fact, I had been taught, that people who were getting liver cancer were the ones consuming, like us, the highest, the highest intake of animal protein or animal-based diets, if you will. I didn't think too much in terms of protein per se, but eating like Westerners. It raised the question, the great American diet causing cancer? Really strange and pretty provocative. I told that to some of my senior colleagues at the time. They thought I was a bit nuts, and I shouldn't go there. But about that same time in, in the 1960s, there was some work came out of India with experimental animals, where basically animals fed either normal levels of protein, 20%, that's the normal level, or the lower level, 5%. And keep in mind, most of the, my remarks are going to concern this range of 5% to 20%. So animals fed 20% as opposed to animals given 5%. The ones given 20%, the normal level, they all, 100%, got the liver tumors. They previously, both sets of animals had been exposed to the carcinogen, but the, they all got the tumors. The animals that got the much lower level did not. Really quite strange, but very significant. This then led to a long series of studies that was funded by the National Institutes of Health, by NIH, uh, published in a number of different journals, also funded to some extent by the American Cancer Society and other places. I, I point this out because at this time, this, this work really was funded by, was handsomely funded, quite frankly, by uh, funding from our public till and from professional agencies. Uh, and did, of course, get it published extensively. And you might wonder, how did that happen if I'm coming on this idea of protein? Well, in those days when we were doing this, I was focused on trying to understand what caused cancer. 
And so we were looking at this sort of model, if you will, studying all these mechanisms of cancer. So the question that we had was, did liver tumors really grow faster when rats are fed normal compared to low protein diets? That was the question, because here are the Indian workers have found this. And secondly, what, like we do, what we like to do in research, we like to say, oh, let's look and find the mechanism, as if there is the mechanism. And so, I mean, that's the way it, research today is done, in fact. We have to go in there and probe all these little details. So there's two main questions. And now, I just want to summarize for you just two slides summarizing these extensive numbers of studies, just to illustrate a point. What we basically found was that we could turn on and turn off tumor growth simply by changing the level of protein intake within that 5 to 20 percent range. I mean, it's really quite remarkable, and I could show you many different ways of looking at that question that we pursued and got that result. It, it was really, it was, it was very exciting in a sense, in some ways. To see something just like protein within that normal range that we actually consume ourselves, just turn on and turn off tumor growth. Um, I could get into some of the details there uh, on that particular slide, but I won't. Uh, I think you can see what I'm talking about over time. In this, incidentally, in this case, is early tumor formation, early cancer. Okay, we're gonna, so we worked with early cancers for some reasons and without actually going to full-blown cancers. Finally, the ultimate study was done, at least in this particular case, um, where these are animals, for example, uh, that were fed for their lifetime protein intake at different levels, 5%, 12%, 20%, look in the top panel there. And if you look across to the right where it says tumor severity, you can see the animals fed the normal level, the 20%, they had a tumor index, if you will, that means numbers of tumors and the size of the tumors and all that, 3,300 and some, the animals fed 5%, it's 248. In other words, huge difference. So we were answering the first question. This normal level of protein just turned on tumor growth, it's amazing. 12%, which is just above the level they actually need for growth, even there, they were turning it on. But once you get below 10%, we looked at that, you didn't see really much any activity. Protein is required, by the way. It's, it's obviously an essential nutrient. But what we were basically showing was when we went above the level that actually was needed, that's when the problem started. And quite frankly, most of us consume more protein than we need. Okay, here's the real kicker. The 5% animals, which my colleagues all thought would have been dead, you know, with tumors, at the end of their life, weren't. They were all lifty, jumping around the cage, uh, living. They were all uh, thrifty, sleek coats, very much alive, and essentially no tumors. The animals fed this good level of protein were all dead. So here we were seeing really in the most robust, extensive kind of study that we could think of doing, showing that just normal levels of protein had this dramatic effect on causing this kind of tumor growth. And there's quite frankly, there's no other nutrient that can have this kind of effect at this particular level. Then in the bottom panel are some other additional sort of observations where we did things like to see if we could intervene. You know, in other words, as tumors are growing up to a certain point in their life, and let's say a quarter of the animals are already having tumors that was 20% and then switching to 5%, they get to 2013 at the end there compared to the 33. In other words, without getting into too much of the details, what we were basically showing here was that even when tumors are already present, we're not, we're not now talking about preventing too much. We're talking about tumors already growing robustly. They're there and we changed the nutrient intake, the protein intake level, and we could switch off fairly late in the process. It's a really kind of interesting idea. So finally, I'm going to tell you what the protein is. I didn't talk a lot about it, certainly not in the grant applications that I was getting and, and so forth, but this protein was casing, cow's milk protein, 87% of cow's milk protein. And I've had quite a lot of experience with the agencies, both in this country and abroad, the United Nations, who look after deciding, you know, what's a carcinogen and what's not. And there are certain criteria that these folks follow. 
criteria that determine when we decide a chemical is carcinogenic, if you will, the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, if I apply those, that, that evidence, these, these, these criteria that's used by everybody else to decide what's a carcinogen, I have to conclude I, there's no other way. And I've given this seminar to professional audiences in universities about four or five times now with this chart. And I don't get any questions, I don't get any comments. Everybody sort of sits there and kind of stunned. But quite frankly, I have to say that casein, which I'm going to argue is reflective of a larger sort of body of evidence having to do with animal proteins in general, is a carcinogen. It's the most significant carcinogen we consume. Forget about DDT and dioxin and things like that. We're talking about animal protein. And I just list here just a quick summary of why I think this is so profound. First off, the evidence is deep. That means to say, instead of finding the mechanism, we, every time we look for a mechanism, we found one. And that's a, that's a really provocative thought. I, I find that so exciting because, and I, I wish I had the time to share with you what I feel like goes on inside of a cell. I mean, it, it's, it's a dynamic system. It's an amazing system. There's all this stuff sort of working together, millions of chemicals that somehow they just all feed in together and they converge to create the same effect. And that's what's happening when protein is fed. So it's real. This is not, this is not fake. So it's, it's deep. It's multiple mechanisms. It's relevant because we're working in a range of 5 to 20 percent. We're not given, you know, really high levels to make us sick or animals sick or anybody, us animals or other animals sick. We're talking about regular levels, so it's relevant. Breath, this effect works also for mammary tumors. That's breast cancer. I had a colleague at the University of Illinois uh, who was working on this at the time, not going into quite so much detail as we did, uh, but nonetheless getting similar results, showing that he could control mammary tumor development as well. Um, also, this effect could be used in cases where the tumor was started with either a chemical carcin or a virus. I mean, some viruses start cancer, like hepatitis B virus in the case of liver cancer. We could basically turn that on and turn it on off too, simply by changing protein intake. The specificity, that's where really things really kind of started heating up because in this case, when we look at use soy or wheat, same level, 20%, it didn't do it. Kind of unique for casein. And of course, now I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I gotta start talking about this a little more publicly and getting into trouble, of course, along the way. Um, but I, quite frankly, I didn't want to stop just at the point of focusing on one nutrient, protein, because I, I have a problem with that. I, as I said in the beginning, I, I think nutrition is about the holistic, integrated effect of all kinds of stuff in food. It's really is what it is. So I don't want to just focus on just this protein effect. Maybe when we're consuming animal protein, for example, and we're consuming as food, maybe the other things in there don't necessarily go along with it. So we wanted to expand our investigation a little bit and ask whether or not it was consistent with other biological effects within that range. And for that, we went into the literature. We had some of our own information, our own data, went into the literature. And here's what, here's what animal proteins do. They increase blood cholesterol. That was first observed in 1909 and studied extensively in the 40s and 50s. And in humans, extensive human studies in the, the 70s and 80s, to the point that animal protein, in my view, is more hypercholesterolemic than a saturated fat. Certainly more than cholesterol itself. It's that significant, and there's lots of studies on that. Lactobumin is another protein in milk, for example. It increases atherosclerosis and other experimental conditions, really quite dramatic. It compromises vitamin D status and increases prostate cancer. Animal protein does. And now we know a lot about that. I think it was uh, Dean already said something about this, as I recall. I forget it was Neil or Dean said something about the vitamin D thing. Well, the vitamin D story is now emerging. You, you probably heard Walsh well, should take vitamin D. It's not really true. You know, people are sort of getting caught in this idea of taking vitamin D when they're consuming the wrong diet, but that's not going to do them a lot of good, in my view. Um, now we know also animal proteins increase that. This is what Dr. Ornish, I think, pointed out, this insulin like growth factor one. It's sort of like the cholesterol of the cancer field. It turns on IGF-1, plant proteins decrease it, increases calcium bone loss. I mean, in other words, you start looking at the literature, you find this animal protein thing is really quite substantial. 
So then you ask another question. What about other nutrients other than animal protein? Maybe do the, are, are there dietary patterns here? You know, getting away from this thing about single nutrients and get on into you know, a broader view of, of the field, if, if you will, uh, maybe animal-based foods versus plant-based foods. That's one way to divide it up. I mean, I, I, I suggest for you thinking there's another way, too, and that's talking about whole natural foods, if you will, as opposed to breaking the foods up and making, you know, things like sugar and fat all by itself. But so this is one way, just animal versus plant-based foods. And so we decided to do a comprehensive human study. It was fortuitous that, in fact, we had this opportunity in rural China. And I want to tell you a little bit about the rural China, the, this China study, because there, as we entered into that study, I came into that study with a background of having serious questions about animal protein and looking for dietary patterns. And the study came about because the Chinese government had established in the 70s that for about a dozen different cancers, these cancers were highly localized geographically around the country. Uh, again, the National Institutes of Health, together with the Chinese government, funded this study. It was the first joint study between the United States and China at the time. Um, and I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who obviously made all this possible for all of us to work together. The four of us were involved, uh, Sir Richard Pito from the University of Oxford in England, brilliant biostatistician, I should add. Um, myself, uh, Wenhan Pan was a student of ours, a PhD student of ours at Cornell, and Jun Shu Chen, who's really one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. Uh, he now tends to be, since I've known him, uh, tends to be the Chinese representative of the United Nations, various uh, panels and so forth. Chen's like a brother. Uh, that's why we look alike, by the way. <laughs> um, in the China study, here were some really exciting uh, data showing that, you know, when I said that cancers occurred in certain parts of the country and not in others, the range of rates, if you will, across the country for these different cancers are shown here for men and women. And you can see it's, what, two or three dozen fold, maybe a couple hundred fold. I mean, cancer was localized in some places, it was, it was right here and over here, it's not here. They had that kind of concentration. In this country, if we see a twofold concentration, or even less, it makes headlines. Here, we're talking about big differences. That's ideal, incidentally, for doing a study. So, okay, let's go to China and organize and see what, in fact, they're doing. And we organized 65 counties, 130 villages, 6,500 adults and their families across the whole of China to do the study. Shown here in the first thing, wide range of rates, as I said. We also had an opportunity to look at a whole lot of other diseases as well as the cancers collected all kinds of information on diet, and lifestyle, and disease by collecting blood samples and urine samples and food samples and asking questions and so forth and so on and then analyzing them. Um, and and, and to, before I get to that, let me just point out to you why the study in some ways was so unique. I go back to the original chart of Ken Carroll's where you see fat intake and breast cancer, a nice straight line, really impressive. We all make any assumptions of dietary fat, if you will. However, those impressions about dietary fat and breast cancer were largely drawn from studies that were done in the upper right quadrant. See where the United States is? We're up there. We're, we're getting close to leading the pack in terms of breast cancer and a lot of these diseases. And so all these human studies have been conducted, case control studies and prospective cohort studies and studies like this have been done on people living up in that region of the world there. Our study was the first that was actually going down near the bottom and looking at what the relationship really is. And this is important because if that line for the whole thing, you know, we, we knew in the upper right hand, right hand quadrant as far as individual studies are concerned that it fit that line, but we didn't know down here at the bottom. And people were in the research world saying, oh, maybe it's not true. Maybe this is just because we have more telephone poles in some places. I mean, all these silly things. So we just wanted to have a look from the dietary perspective about China. And China was in the lower left hand quadrant. Now, here's just some summary information on what we found in China, we, we ended up looking at lots and lots of different things, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but I just want to summarize here a couple of points. First off, in rural China, look at the energy intake, the calorie intake is higher, it's 10, 11% higher in rural China than it is here, per body weight. 
Well, and part of that is attributable to the fact that the Chinese are more physically active. However, this will surprise you. The Chinese we're looking at here, these are the office worker type Chinese. They're the least active, and they're still consuming 10 to 11% more. Pretty, I mean, they still go to work on their bicycles and things like that, so I think, but there, there's another effect here, and it has to do with the fact, I'm convinced of this, people who are consuming a low-fat, sort of plant-based diet, um, basically consume more energy and end up gaining less body weight. You heard Dr. Orney say that. And I think uh, Dr. Bernard said the same thing, and, and Dr. McDougall, of course, and others have made this point many times. Eat more, weigh less kind of thing. Uh, you can see the body mass index, which is uh, the body mass or weight, excess weight, is lower in China. Okay, the fat intake in China, as you can see, is much lower than here, 14% versus 36%. In rural China, uh, dietary fiber is about three times higher. There's the key, is animal protein, and just using it as an index of the kind of diet. Our diet in the United States and other Western countries is, has 10 times the concentration of animal protein as does or was, in fact, the case in rural China. That's changing, incidentally, in China, particularly in the city areas. They're starting to do what we do, and they're, I don't know why, why they're doing that, but they're doing it. Uh, blood cholesterol levels uh, in rural China, their high is near our low. The average cholesterol level in rural China is about 127 milligrams per deciliter. Really quite remarkable. But enough for that. Um, we then, actually with m many colleagues from different universities and elsewhere, looked at specific relationships that were of interest at the time. And basically, it seemed like every time we looked for a relationship and then asked this kind of question, does it point to this, this dietary pattern thing? Does it point to an animal thing or a plant thing? First, every time we looked at it, it says it points to a plant-based diet. And this was really quite remarkable, because keep in mind, in China, the amount of animal protein they were consuming is really quite low. It's only one-tenth of ours. But still within that range, what we can see, as soon as they start creeping up and getting little animal protein-based foods in their, in their diet, these Western diseases started to occur. And we looked at this in many different ways. Really quite remarkable. So it, it went beyond the question of pro animal protein per se. The more significant question was just animal-based foods and or the lack of plant-based foods. Whole, I should say, whole uh, natural plant-based foods. So after doing a lot of these comparisons and interpreting a wide variety of these relationships, as I said, virtually all favor the nutrient composition of plant-based foods. And uh, we sort of made that conclusion we hesitate in science sometimes to make conclusions like this, but by this time, after having so much information and such a broad basis for the information, um, it led to that thing at the bottom, the richer the diets is and the kind and amount of nutrients provided by plant-based foods, the lower is the risk for these chronic degenerative diseases we see in the West. Now, I want to go back a little bit because it raises some other kinds of questions. Let's go back to the background slide I showed in the beginning of Ken Carroll that seemed to captivate so many of us for so long showing a relationship between breast cancer and, and um, total fat. And let's, let's look at that line a little closely. And, and just allow me to speculate a little bit here. If you take that line down, it crosses that x-axis at the bottom, where you can see there's no breast cancer when people are consuming, what is it, 30 grams or so a day of fat? That's about right, we need some fat, but it's pretty low. In other words, up to about that level of fat, we don't really see anything, it's kind of neat. I went back and actually took, uh, I actually, uh, Ken Carroll had these data, I just simply put some lines on it, some regression lines, but it turns out if you look at, as he did, you look at the relationship between plant fats and cancers, breast cancer, you don't see anything. So it's something about, it's not, it's not plant fats, but if you look at animal fats, now see where that line goes? Right through the origin. Very different. I mean, that's really pretty remarkable, I think. And that, that line, I mean, it couldn't be better. It sort of says, it's even, added, even adding just a small amount of animal fat, if we sort of, I'm going to call animal fat, let's put single quotes around that. You know, just small amounts of animal fat sort of starts creating this problem. However, I'm going to call it animal-based foods. We made a mistake 20, 30 years ago in focusing on fat. 
It wasn't animal fat. In fact, we have evidence now to suggest that maybe the polyunsaturated fats of plants are more problematic in causing tumor growth than the, than the animal fats. But, big but, this only occurs when total fat intake is high. So it raises questions about high fat diets, quite frankly. So it's animal based foods, not fat. Um, now I want to go back to another question, and, and this is, has to do with the nurse's health study. And I, I'm sorry I have to pick on the nurse's health study at Harvard. Um, I, I know the investigators there quite well. Um, have known him from the beginning, particularly Professor Willett, who has been heading this up. But Professor Willett got involved in this really marvelous study of some, what is it, 88, 90,000, I think it's up to about 120,000 nurses these days, and you've heard of it, I think. How many have heard of the nurse's health study? Okay, everybody's heard of the nurse's health study. Uh, he got involved in this question asking back in 1984, right after we had finished putting together a policy statement from the National Academy of Sciences to reduce fat intake, he organized this study to look at the relationship between fat intake and breast cancer for this large group of nurses. And after eight years, four years, eight years, and then subsequently 12 years, what he found was as fat, if you look at the amount of fat intake that women are consuming over that range, he saw no relationship. That observation has nearly destroyed, it really caused a big problem, it's almost destroyed the diet and, and disease proposition to some considerable extent. Because all of a sudden now you're hearing, public's getting, public's getting confused, if fat has nothing to do with breast cancer, what next? I mean, it's that kind of thing. Um, I want to tell you what the answer to this is. Namely, look at the yellow, yellow thing, you know, I say it's all in the R, and I don't, you probably don't know what correlation coefficients are, regression coefficients, but basically, it turns out that in the original data of Ken Kale, that slide shown there, as fat intake goes up, animal protein intake goes up right along with it. You get about a 90% correlation, the highest you can have is 100%, 90% is really impressive. So an international basis is about 90%. In contrast, in Western populations, where we're eating all the wrong stuff, it turns out these women, and I can say that's for probably all people in this country who have followed this advice, as they de decrease their fat intake, you know, by using lean cuts of meat and skim milk and this and that, as they decrease their fat intake, quite frankly, their pro animal protein, it was going up, if anything. So, you know, they're gaining on this hand in theory, losing big time on this hand. Under those circumstances, if you look at the experimental, and I don't have the chance to get into this, but if you look at this critically, that's a recipe for disaster. Because it's not the animal fat, it's animal-based foods, really is what, what, what this is all about. And it has to do with this, this uh, correlation coefficient we know, and we have some very good data on what this is all about. Now, I just threw some other odds and ends in here. Uh, just to catch your attention, I think this was mentioned by who? Dr. Bernard, I believe. And, and you, know, no, you know what? Oh, Dean Orney said this. No, he said this. He's got this study going right now. Um, we already have this information on prostate cancer and skim milk. How many of you heard this? In the, how many of you read this in the Los Angeles Times? Or the New York Times? Or heard on TV? I mean, you know, you know, the Harvard group has done much of this work, and I do have to give them credit for this, and that includes Walt Willett, by the way. No, actually, it doesn't include Walt well, It's another guy by the name of Ed Giovannucci and, and June Chen, who's now at Berkeley. They have summarized recently of 14 case control studies that have been done on dairy and prostate cancer of 14. 12 have shown a statistically significant relationship, and the other two just aren't strong enough to see anything. And they conclude that of all the predictors of prostate cancer, the consumption of dairy is the best predictor of prostate cancer. And how many people have heard this? It's just not getting out there. Somebody's, I don't want to say cooking the data, but they're controlling things. Uh, okay, now, I, I sort of come to this, finally come to this point of view of I guess in a, in a scientific sense, being a bit of a fool and start talking about these kinds of things publicly. And, and the information is getting out there, I think to some extent about the protein thing. 
And lo and behold, in 2002, we had this report, this esteemed report that comes from the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academy of Sciences, a group of people. I mean, th th this particular group of people are the ones who set national nutrition policy. They're the ones who set dietary guidelines, not dietary guidelines, but they, they're the ones that determine RDAs and things like this. I mean, they had, they're very powerful. They're working behind the scenes, usually unbeknownst to the American public, and setting standards. And the references they set, and they review them every five years or so, the references they set are used to establish what the school lunch program looks like. They're the, they're the, they're the references set for hospital food. You know how great that is. It's the references set for the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children's program. I mean, it's, th th this is what it's all about. Well, they just came out just last year with this report, and this is on the front page of their executive summary and their news, news summaries. And say, the report recommends that to meet the body's daily nutritional needs while minimizing risk for chronic disease, adults should consume 10 to 35 percent from protein. Wow. That's incredible. And, and furthermore, the added sugars, you know, and they're specific, they're make, making this, that candy, soft drinks, fruit drinks, patients, other sweets, should comprise no more than 25% of total calories consumed. <laughs> it, it, it's, just, it's just a coincidence, by the way, that M&M Mars helped to fund this study. <laughs> and the Coca-Cola industry. This is a National Academy of Science. This is, this is the body that's supposed to be making the sort of prominent statement. And I've served on a number of those expert panels myself, and I don't remember when we were doing that, that we had that kind of support. We were using public money. Now the industry is coming in there and sort of getting some money behind us. And yeah, I know it doesn't have any effect on all of this, but um, to say that 35% protein is okay, it's associated with a minim minimizing you know, chronic disease risk, I think it's obscene. I, I don't know how else to say it. The 25% uh, added sugars, by the way, is really interesting. They set 25% at the same time the WHO was coming up with a report, about the same time, where they're making similar kinds of determinations. They said the maximum should be 10%. And the chairman is a, is a friend of mine, the chairman of that panel, Phil James. Uh, so they said 10%. And here in the West, this came out just before the WHO report did, they said 30, 25%. So I wondered. How can a group of scientists, two groups of scientists, come up with these very different figures? 25%, you can go up to 20, or 10%? Well, it turns out, as they say, I don't know, maybe the MNMRs did have something to do with it. The, the sugar industry gets on their high horse and basically are going and threatening the WHO report and the panel and said, get that thing, that 10% up to 25%. If you don't, we're going to go see Tommy Thompson we got some friends in the White House. We're going to go to Congress, and we're going to ask the United States to withdraw funds from the United Nations. That's what happened. And I don't know how many of you really know that, but they really did use strong-arm tactics to try to get the, the United Nations panel to change their 10% level for added sugars up to 25%, like the United States did. I mean, we, we behaved. We, we did the right thing. We got up to 25%, you see. I'll come back to the protein thing just for a minute. I just want to um, show you how, how important this really is. I've talked about the 5 to 20 percent, and incidentally, let, let me say this, that the experimental animal work that I did, or we did, uh, experimental animals are like us animals. The amount of protein we require is the same as they do, and it's all sort of coincidence. It's about the same. If you look at the range of intake of protein for us animals, us humans, we range between 11 and 22 percent. That is, 5% of us are a little lower than 11%. 5% of us, you know, the weightlifters and stuff, some of the weightlifters up 22%. The amount that we, we've known for 50 years how much protein we need, we only need 10%. Our average intake is 17%. We're somewhere between 11 and 22. And nobody hardly goes above 22. Now this esteemed body is coming along and telling us we can go up to 35. You know, welcome Atkins. I, I could go on and on about this, but I won't, especially since the chairman of the Food and Nutrition Board is now the director of the division of which I'm in at Cornell University. Okay, so let me make a couple concluding remarks here. I, I think it's time, you know, we, we've got to take this idea 
and bring it to a new level of discussion. And it's got to have certain characteristics. We can't just sit, sit around and talk to each other. We've got to somehow invade the medical establishment. I know what it's all about. And, and really open this up for the public, because I think the public's really interested in this. I, I disagree with many of my colleagues who say the public's not interested. And I'm going to say this, whereas major disease rates have remained high in recent years, whereas the cost of medical care is the highest in the world, a couple of givens, whereas contemporary food production is causing environmentally unsound, isn't it possible that we should start taking nutrition seriously? And if it's properly investigated, interpreted, and practiced, it could become the premier biological science of the future? I mean, this is where it's at. It's not there now. It has something to do with who's controlling the information. And this is something the public really doesn't understand. What goes on behind the scenes in the development of policy, reference standards, you know, it's, it's basically who's controlling the agenda. That's what it's about. And it's something that's terribly misunderstood by the public. Almost no one really knows about this unless you've been in the boardrooms and sort of watched this kind of thing. And incidentally, I don't want to treat this superficially. It's not about industry funding the research. The industry probably has funds about 5 to 10 percent of the research in this field in this country. It's money coming from the government, basically. It's also not about industry paying off people. It's also not about the vast majority of scientists being, you know, dishonest and stuff like that. It's not true. The vast majority of scientists are hardworking, diligent, devoted people to their work. They're working in kind of narrow little areas. So, I mean, we, we do have a, a class of very hardworking people. I don't want to disparage them. I mean, we have a few people sort of behave like something else. They just sort of make there are the transition. So, in any case, I, I don't want to get into this too much, but what I do want to say is that we need to take this information elevated to a level of professionalism widely discussed and get it out there and start thinking about it in that sort of way. And so I've been asking myself at least, you know, where, where do we go with all this? How, how, do, how does this happen? How do we expand this story beyond, um, beyond us who have been involved in this to some extent? As I say, it's about who controls the information, who funds it, who makes policy, who dispenses it. You know, who's making policy is the one that's really, you heard, um, who was it? Yeah, uh, Neil Bernard talk about what the American Cancer Society wants to run some bulls down to Peach Street in Atlanta these days and every other street in the United States. And you know, I would really urge you to you know, follow Neil's advice on that. Contact him. We need to have transparency, discourse, and open education. Right now, we can't have that because we don't have the resources. We're sort of tied into sort of doing little bits of studies here and there and stuff. I really am interested in somehow going to, 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 to establish, let's say, at a major institution that has some recognition, to establish a place where we can have lots of transparency, lots of discourse, lots of open education. And the only way we can do that is to have the funding that lasts forever. It's the only way. We can't sort of just go from two years, three years, go back into the till all the time because that's how the information is controlled. I know it so well. The control is really who has the funding to give out to do what is being done. Those of us in this kind of field here, we don't have any money. We can't. I mean, who's going to fund vegetarian research, for crying out loud? <laughs> you know, it's, it's really difficult. And so we need to sort of figure out some way to get this going. And quite frankly, um, we have, in fact, given consideration to this at Cornell. We are and have been for many years ranked as the top institution, the number one institution in the country, both in terms of quality and quantity. And I think Cornell would be a good place to sort of hang our hat in doing this kind of thing, as long as we had the resources. We thought this through fairly carefully uh, as to what we want to do. We have an internal advisory group. We have an external advisory group, uh, really a, a blue ribbon uh, panel, I should say. And so we're on, on track of trying to do this. And I'm just going to conclude to tell you that, you know, whether we do it or whether someone else does it, this is what we need to do. We've got to raise the consciousness of this country to the level of really understanding this. And I would, I, two of my colleagues are here actually who are sort of running the shop for us. Uh, Dr. Banu Parpia and David Cruschel, where are you? Wait a minute. And way in the back there. Uh, there I, I think Jeff invited me to.
Jeff invited me to go ahead and make these remarks. Uh, I, I hope that you don't think it's self-serving. I, I, I'm, I'm too old for that anyhow, and I, you know, we'll, we'll go on and do something, <laughs> we'll do something else. But I, I want just simply in terms of, the, of you know, the, the idea. I want the public to get more involved in this. I want all kinds of scientists and other sorts of people to get involved in this kind of symposium and workshops and study period, you know, and to have the money to do it. And so there is a brochure in your packet, I think, that's called PLN, uh, Program for Lifetime Nutrition. I'll leave that thought with you and simply say, we have arrived with this information, and if you don't believe me, wait till you hear Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Uh, Furman and, and uh, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Lyle, who's got this new book out telling us why we can't get on with these, Dr. Lyle and, and Dr. Goldhammer. I mean, these are the people out there really doing things. And we're, we're ready to go. We just need to involve the public more in this sort of thing and to get their kind of support. Thank you.